sometimes, well, what if of all the people that I would expect to want to give up, it would be Ezekiel. Um, not only the stuff that he gave up, you know, his call, his, his wife, um, but the situation he was living in, he was getting pressured from all different sides, from the exiles, from people in Judah. Of all the people prophesying for almost 20 years with no visible fruit, what if he had decided this is not worth it anymore? What, what if Jeremiah had decided all this preaching, it just isn't worth it anymore, I'm going to give up. I'm going to do something that might actually make some difference in people's life. What if they would have done that? You know, because even though Ezekiel and Jeremiah didn't see the fruit of their ministry, we're part of their fruit. Isn't that amazing? When you think about it, the, the seeds that they laid in the ground by writing their oracles down, by recording the history, the time that they lived, by God using their story, were part of the fruit of their ministry. You know, you think of all the hundreds and hundreds of generations who have read the book of Jeremiah or who have read the book of Ezekiel, people that have been influenced profoundly. <coughs> you know, I'm so grateful that Ezekiel didn't give up. I'm so grateful that Jeremiah didn't give up. Because if they had, I wouldn't have this kind of encouragement to keep doing what I do. You know, this is the kind of stuff that we really need because there, there will be times in your ministry, I, I, can, I can guarantee it because I know what life is like. There will be times when you'll face hardship. There will be times when you'll have to pay a very high cost. It's because life is not fair. There are, bad things are gonna happen to you guys. I mean, that's basically one, one thing that I can promise. I think Jonathan over, or Joseph, jo Jeremiah, that guy there. He said basically, you know, these people seemed like they were surprised at persecution. We shouldn't be surprised, but this is gonna come. Am I willing, in the face of persecution, in the face of seeing very little real fruit, am I willing to continue to pursue God's call in my life? Am I willing to continue to be obedient, whatever it is he asks. And Father, you know that that's my heart. Father, you know that I, I don't want to give up. I want to finish well. Father, you know the discouragements that happen. You know the this affliction or discomfort or suffering, life, Lord, in my life and in the lives of all the other precious people here. Father, you know all those hard things. But Father, we, we want to be willing to do this. I pray that you would, you would so work in our hearts that we would be willing to continue to go year after year after year, even if we don't see what we expect to see. Even if we don't see any fruit to the ministry that you've called us to do, Father, I pray that you would give us a soft heart to continue to listen to your voice. Um, because what else is there to do? There's nothing, I'd, nothing else I'd rather do than follow you. Father, I pray that you would give me grace. I pray for my brothers and sisters here as well. Um, that each one of us here, no matter what the cost is that they will pay, uh, no matter what the hardship is that they will endure. Father, I know that your grace is sufficient. I know that to be true that your grace is sufficient for all the things that are going on right now, for all the things that will come. Your grace is sufficient, just as it was in Ezekiel's life. I'm so grateful for that, Lord. In Jesus' name. So I've, I've been very, very challenged by, um, by this guy, Ezekiel. Um, just by his life, by his willingness, uh, to continue on even when it's hard. I'm very, very challenged and I trust as you read these books that you start thinking about the people that are behind the story. Like in Jeremiah we have a, a, quite a bit of his personal story. In Ezekiel not so much. But start thinking about these people and, and the incredible legacy that they've left. Uh, whether or not Jeremiah, Ezekiel, we don't know that he had any children. Jeremiah didn't. Whether he left a physical legacy among children um, they left this great spiritual legacy that we're part of the inherit, we're some of the inheritors of. Um, so think about these people as you as you read these words. They're not just words on a page. They represent the lifeblood of somebody. They represent the seeds that this person has planted. 
um, for future generations. I'm so grateful for that. Okay, hey, uh, we maybe should actually start thinking about the book a little bit. And in the next half hour, we'll see what we can cover, okay? Um, I have another little thing. We're going to start actually with chapter one. Uh, this is because this is what I like to do. Chance, you're going to get, you're going to get another chance. Oh, he's not even here. Oh well, Chance would have had another chance to draw, um, but it's it's too bad. Okay, here we are. Just take a sheet of paper. And do you guys have colored pencils or markers or something? We're only going to take a couple minutes to do this. Okay, if you can pass them in the back there as well. Um, there's plenty of papers, so everybody should get one, but get your colored pencils or markers, whatever you have. Pens are fine. Here you go, Sarah. Because as, as you know, this book is full of really some very weird things. And so what we're going to do, first of all, is that we are, as individuals, I'd like you to read chapter one. Okay. And what I'd like you to do is to draw what you read about. Okay? And again, we're only going to take a few minutes to do this, so it'll be a great challenge for all you artists and non-artists out there. Um, but I want you to draw what you see in chapter one. Okay? Draw what you see in chapter one.
Okay, how about uh, three board minutes, okay? Okay, let's uh, finish up our drawings. <coughs> like I said, there's there's no shame. I will even show you my drawing. <laughs> you can see the four creatures and the throne. There, it looks like there's a little puppet doll on there, but it's actually supposed to be the likeness of the human form. Those are my, okay. So show your neighbors what you've drawn. Okay, show your neighbors. Oh, great. Great. Hey, any
Any, anybody want to show their drawing to the whole class? Anybody want to show their drawing to everybody? Yeah, everybody, anybody want to show their drawing? No. Woohoo! Oh, look. There's, he's got one. Look at that. There you go. Look at that. Good one. Wow. Yay. Yay. Anybody else want to show their drawing? Oh, look, hers. Good. Wow. Anybody else? Yay. Yay, look at that one. Jenny. Woo. Jenny. 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 Uh, wow. Nice, very nice. John. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good one. Good one. Yeah. Okay, so how did, how did that work out for you to be able to draw what he was seeing? Yeah, hard, right? Yeah. Uh, can you imagine, okay, this is what Ezekiel has seen this stuff that he can hardly describe, right? And so he's trying to describe what he saw in words that people would be able to at least get a glimpse of. And so we, as we try to decipher what it was that he saw, we can come up with these really great drawings. But you get the impression he's trying to describe something that is indescribable, right? Um, and he's, try, he's describing something where God is sitting, right? He's, that's the impression that you get from all this stuff. That This is something that's going on in the heavenly places, in heaven, if you will. Okay, this is what the vision that he's had of the presence of the Lord, the glory of the Lord is so strong that he falls down when he sees this vision. This is a vision of God himself and the throne of God. When we get into Revelation, you'll see that a lot of this kind of imagery comes back again because John sees something very similar. Um, but he's trying to put into language, into limited language, stuff that cannot be limited. Okay, but what I'd like you to do now with your, in your table, at your table, with your table mate, look at the different things that he has described in this picture and think about what they mean. What, what might those eyes mean? What might those wings mean? What, what is this picture that you're seeing? Try to discern, determine what is the meaning behind all of this stuff that he talks about. Okay, so talk about it in your, at your tables.
I'd like to hear some of your insights. What were, what were some of the things that you were able to determine from this vision? What were some of the things that might be important here for the readers to understand? What was the stuff that, what, what did this mean actually? Anybody want to offer some thoughts? What did this stuff mean? Yeah. Well, um, I was thinking that the, the faces might not be so much like physical faces. Like the, the things described aren't really like physical things. They're like uh -huh. the spiritual reality. So uh -huh. maybe like it was sort of God trying to give symbols to like make sense of things, but it yeah. still didn't really make sense. And what was he saying through these symbols then? Um, I don't know, like maybe like the that the 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 angels are like they're they're like humans somehow that like maybe they, um, are also I, I don't know. Um, yeah. but then like the the lion maybe they're like courageous and like Good. ox maybe they're like Good. God's workers and they work Good. Hard. Yeah. So, Good. Like, I think there's something <laughs> significant there. You know, something about these these creatures that um, represents something. So good, good thought. Yeah, did you have something? Yeah, uh, was, we were talking about uh, two different uh, uh, things, and they have the, the, the direction turned to every side. Uh -huh. So God can see everything. Good. He has control of everything. Good. And, and it also represents his, his character. He's a human, uh, but he's uh, like a lion, the, the most powerful Animal, uh huh. Good. And ox is strong and powerful, and eagle and like it is also yeah, good. the, the um, most powerful bird. Yeah, good. But it, and it also the, uh, written about the eagle many times in the Bible. He, he when his children doesn't manage to fly, he comes and take them up. Uh huh. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Very good thoughts. Really good thoughts. Dave, did you want to add something to that? Good. Good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really true. Whatever it was that he saw, you know, this was just showing the glory and the power and the magnificence of God. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Anybody else? What What did you see as significant here? Yeah, Pine. I think they are very well coordinated. They are connected with good. each other. Yeah. And when they move, they are not out of their own um, decision. They are led by the Spirit. Good. Led by the Spirit and moving together in unity. Good. Very good. Anybody else? Want to, yes. I was thinking about the wheels, thought maybe, because it says they're touching the earth, maybe it shows God's desire for his realm, his reality, to always be connected to the, parts, the reality that we see, the earth, heaven and earth coming together. Good, yeah. Yeah, and what else do you see about wheels? What do wheels usually do? Move. Right, yeah, and that's what we see these wheels doing as well. We see the wheels moving. Um, and does that say something about God? That these wheels on whatever this thing is, they're moving. What does that say about God? Yeah, he's active. He's everywhere. You know, he's not just in Israel, but his throne, he's got this mobile throne that is even moving across the land in Babylon. I mean, think about where Ezekiel is. He's in Babylon. He sees this throne with wheels on it. And with eyes everywhere, God is seeing everything. God is moving everywhere. This majesty and this power that God has isn't limited to one place or one city or one temple. It's everywhere. Good, really good thoughts. Anybody else want to add something to this? What else have you seen? I think we, yeah, Stephen. Well, it's not so much what he sees, it's just the fact that he's receiving the vision from God in the first place. Good. Yeah, good. And especially when you, what Stephen said, it's, it shows how, how God really wanted to have communication with him, that, that he was showing him this vision, he was revealing something to him. And when you think about where Ezekiel was, he was in Babylon. He was far away from the holy city, from where God lived. 
right? He was far away from the temple, and that's where God lived, right? God lived in the temple. And here God shows up in Babylon, actually, when he has this vision. Um, can you imagine the power of that? Thinking, well, God, God didn't leave us behind. You know, he, we didn't leave God behind. He didn't forget us. He sees us even while we're here. He's here with us. And that's the message through this whole book as well. He sees everything. He's not, he's not just living in one temple in Jerusalem, but he's everywhere. He's sovereign over all the nations. His, his throne is actually, if, if they call it a chariot throne. You know, his, his throne, which represents his majesty and his kingship, his dominion, that's everywhere. He's all-seeing, he's all-powerful, he's, he's all-knowing, and this is kind of the stuff that's being captured in this vision. Do you see how once you start pulling some of these little elements out, you can, you can start understanding, okay, this vision, when you first start trying to decode it, it's really crazy. But you start looking at the different elements, he's trying to describe something that can't be described, but you can understand the intent behind it. Uh, that God didn't leave the exiles on their own. You know, the exiles may have thought that they were somehow lesser people. They may have thought that God had abandoned them, that God had forgotten them. Um, but this is such a clear picture. No, God is in Babylon just as much as he's in Jerusalem. God is here with you guys as exiles just as much as he is in the temple. He has just as much power and authority and glory here as he does back there. So yes, I'm with you, even though you're enduring this punishment, even though you're going through this very difficult time, I'm with you, and I'm going to be with you. I'm still strong, I'm still powerful. And especially when, when you think about um, what Ezekiel has been going through, you know, like what we've talked about before, and thinking, you know, has God forgotten me out here in, in the wilderness? I've given up everything, you know, I've paid such a high price. Has God really forgotten me? Does he not care? And then he has this vision of the incredible power and presence and um, majesty of the Lord even there in Babylon. And so you start, you start seeing this, the glimpse of, of who God is and what, what he's trying to communicate to Ezekiel through this book. And this is how the book starts. Okay, it starts with this really crazy vision. But what a great way to start Ezekiel's ministry. And I suspect that that stayed with him for the rest of his life. I mean, there are a couple of different times in the book when he's confronted with the glory of God. And his response is to fall down. <laughs> You know, so I know it's not something that he would forget. But this is, you know, especially when we're going through these difficult times in ministry, when we're paying the cost, when we're not seeing the fruit that we would like to see, these are the kinds of things that we hang on to. The, the presence and the glory of God that has been revealed to us um, in the DBS, in the times of worship here, these are things that you take with you when you go. These are things that will give you strength and encouragement for the for the challenges that you face ahead. Uh, so I, th I think this is so, it's so cool uh, that God did this because what he did was that he marked Ezekiel um, in such a, he, he marked him really with this glory of God. And this is a, through the whole book. You see the glory coming here. You see the glory. Do you remember the story about the glory leaving the temple? You know, Ezekiel gets this vision of the temple and all the idol worship, and you actually see the glory leaves the old temple. But then at the end of the book, he has this miraculous other vision of this new temple and the, the dwelling place of the Lord. The name of the city is the Lord is there. He's always there. You have the, the waters of life coming through it. So it's, he starts from the glory at the very beginning of the book that he's overwhelmed by, that, that he encounters at different times through the book in, in different ways. And then at the end of the book you see, wow, this is an amazing, an amazing thing that brings the whole book together, the glory of God from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. The, the presence of God, it's like the, like the pre-Jesus incarnation of God that we see in both a vision like this or in the temple vision that he gets at the end of the book. You see that God's presence is there even among the ex exiles. That God's presence is there even when the city is destroyed. That God's presence is there with his people even when the people are scattered. Um, no matter who's in charge, no matter where they're living, no matter what their circumstances are, God is there, God sees, he hasn't forgotten, he's still powerful. And he cares. 
You know, you think, wow, this is so amazing. And, and this is, you know, when you start reading this book, you see, no, it's not so weird and scary after all. It's a, a very clear picture of God's character and his majesty, of his power and his glory, of his all-powerful nature, of his all-seeing nature. Um, such a, a powerful picture of, of who God is. Um, and that's one thing, in the rest of your life of Bible study, as you continue to read Ezekiel, um, that's one thing to notice is this contrast. I mentioned from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, we have this overarching theme of the glory of God. Um, but watch for the contrast in this book, because you remember that vision. I just mentioned it when Ezekiel is taken in the spirit to the temple and the elders in the temple. You know, there's 70 elders that are, are worshiping, but not God. They're worshiping idols. Then there are 25 elders that have their face away from the temple. They're worshiping the sun, apparently. You have the women that are weeping for Tammuz, who was a, uh, another god who was a god of vegetation. This was part of a ritual that they did. And you see, this is happening in the temple grounds from what, from what Ezekiel sees. And that's a picture of the people of God at the beginning, of the way that they were worshiping God at the beginning, this incredible idolatry in the very presence of God. So the glory leaves. His presence leaves that temple. When it comes back at the end, look at the temple that, that, that God shows Ezekiel at the end, where everything is pure, everything is symmetrical, everything is in order, everything is designed to perfectly show what worship is. It's like even though the old temple that was going to be destroyed was a temple of idolatry, that this new temple that's coming, this new hope that God is giving Ezekiel, this new hope will be perfect. Um, his presence will be there forever. God will live there forever. And this is something that we're looking forward to still. You know, this vision of the temple gives such a great picture of, of actually the habitation of God in our hearts as well. You know that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, think of that in terms of this picture, this perfect temple at the end of the book, that we now are the dwelling place of God in a way that, that he never quite dwelled in the temple. He never was embodied in the, in the temple um, that was made of stone, but now he's, he's in our temple. And so watch for that contrast. You know, the temple at the beginning, the temple of idolatry, and then this perfect temple at the very end, um, however you want to interpret that. Okay, remember I mentioned before there are several different ways to interpret some of these things. Um, and there are Bible-believing Christians who love Jesus who interpret that temple vision in several different ways. And there's this whole, you'll encounter it again in Daniel, um, Zechariah, I don't think you guys have read Zechariah yet. Um, Revelation, when you get there, there's this whole thing that we've seen a short little example of here, it's called apocalyptic literature. Um, and it's a whole genre of, of literature that we do find in several places in the Bible. It was quite common. Um, especially during the intertestamental period from about 200 BC to 200 AD. Uh, Revelation is very much part of that, but it's very symbolic. It usually um, is written for people who are going through some kind of struggle. Uh, we see that both in Revelation, we see that certainly here in Ezekiel, and when we get into Daniel, it's written to people who have struggle, and it's, it's these amazing, amazing pictures that are like fantasy pictures. Uh, that are meant to be very symbolic. If you've ever read the book, uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, I'd really recommend it because they have a very good section in that book. It's a great book that you might want to add to your library. Um, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Um, and what they do in their book is they take the different types of literature in the Bible and tell you how to read them. Um, just like you read poetry different than you would read a history textbook. Uh, you need to read apocalyptic literature different than you would need to read a gospel. Okay, it's meant to be very symbolic. Um, you're meant to get impressions from this stuff. Uh, you're, meant to, you're meant to discover hope for the future. Uh, you're meant to discover the character of God in some of these things. And you'll see it again when you get to Daniel and um, Zechariah and Revelation. But that's called apocalyptic literature. And we just see a couple glimpses of that here. Um, but it's not so hard to interpret once you start, like what you guys did with the throne, the mobile throne, getting, pulling some of these ideas out about all-seeing, all-powerful, the majesty of God. It's not so hard to interpret once you start thinking about it as pictures. You know, he's, he's trying to picture something that you can't describe. 
Okay, so watch for that contrast then between the, the temple of idolatry and the temple at the end. Um, there's another, uh, there are a lot of contrasts in this book actually from the very beginning to the very end. Um, another one that I'd like to, you to call your attention to is in chapter 34. And this is in the restoration passage and in chapter 34 he talks about uh, the bad shepherds. Okay, and he talks about the bad shepherds, he talks about all the things that they're not doing. Um, how they haven't strengthened the weak, how they haven't healed the sick, how they haven't bound up the injured. Um, and he gives the hope for the future that he's going to be their shepherd himself. Uh, that he will be the one that in spite of the bad treatment they've had under their bad shepherds, their bad leaders, that he will come and make that all right because he will feed them. Um, that he will bind up their wounds, that he will heal their injuries, that he'll make them do lie down, um, that he'll go out and seek the lost, that he'll find all the ones that are strayed in a way that the bad shepherds haven't. And you have this amazing contrast here in chapter 34 about the, the bad shepherds that they have and the good shepherd that's still to come. Does that good shepherd sound familiar to you? Yeah. 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 Isn't, that, isn't that cool how we get a little glimpse of it here? And so when you read the Gospel of John and Jesus <coughs> says, I am the good shepherd, look back at chapter 34 in Ezekiel and see what it is that he means. Look back at Psalm 23 and see what it is that he means when he says he's the good shepherd. But he's the contrast to all these bad shepherds. And this is something that God is going to do. He's giving people a glimpse of hope that they have in the future, even if they're not going to be able to live through that lifetime or through that themselves, that this is hope that they have as a people for shepherds that are no longer so evil. Um, and he talks about the, the king is actually involved in being a shepherd as well. In chapter uh, uh, 37 he says that my servant David will be a king over them and they will have one shepherd. So again that just is such a, a cool idea. Um, somebody already mentioned chapter 37, that's the Valley of Dry Bones. Again, look at the contrast there. Um, see the, the life that has been sucked out of the people. Think about the discouragement that um, both people in Jerusalem who have been exiled, people who are living there in Jerusalem through the fall of the city. Uh, think of the people that are in exile, the people that have taken, been taken away from their families and their homes, their identity. Um, think of the dry bones of discouragement that they have. Uh, think of the life that's been sucked out of them. Uh, think of the life that seems to be no longer there for the whole people. And God gives this amazing picture in chapter 37 of the, the life that he brings through the Spirit that will bring these bones back together in a way that they never thought would be possible. Who's ever seen a pile of bones? that could ever come back together and then flesh starts forming. And then they become living because the Spirit is breathed into them. Who ever thought that that would be happening? And I think to the people that are living through this experience of exile or living through the experience of the fall of the city, um, this kind of message that where there was death, where you see death all around you, that the Lord is bringing life, the Lord will bring life, that's what He wants to do. That he will, with his spirit, he will breathe life into these dry bones. And he will make something new out of what was old and dead. And then he promises this new covenant, which is very much related to that. And you've already read about the new covenant in, um, in Jeremiah, right? But think about it here in Ezekiel, because you'll find the same thing here in Ezekiel, this idea of the new covenant. Uh, life where there had been death. A heart of flesh where there has been a heart of stone. The law and the, and the precepts of the Lord written on your heart rather than written on tablets. Uh, the living word rather than a dead word that you, that you don't even know anymore. But look at that in, in this new promises, the new covenant that Ezekiel talks about echoing what Jeremiah has already said. And again, they're both prophesying at the same time to people that have no hope in the current system that they have no hope, they see how much they've failed. And here God comes in and says, I'm promising you new, new life. I'm promising you a new shepherd, a shepherd who will do everything that your bad shepherds haven't done. Mm -hmm. And I'm promising you a new covenant, even. I'm still your covenant, God, but this is a new covenant, a better covenant, 
There'll be better promises, a better hope, which is the message of Hebrews. But this is a kind of thing that Ezekiel just gives a little glimpse of. So in the rest of your life of Bible study, as you're reading through this book, watch for those contrasts. The stuff that was dead, God brings life to. The stuff that was evil, God brings hope to. The stuff that was old and passing away, God is renewing and bringing new life to. Um, watch for that, it's so very clear. And, and you see it all tied together by this, this picture of the glory of God and how the Spirit of God working in the, in the glory of, the God, of God um, brings life everywhere where there hasn't been life, where there's been only death and discouragement. He brings life. And so the rest of your life of Bible study, as you continue to read this book of Ezekiel, uh, watch for some of those things. There's an incredible amount of wealth in here, just these treasures that are buried. Um, one of my favorite scriptures, actually, this is a good scripture for Yo as well. I see Yo in the back. One of my favorite scriptures um, as I was reading Hebrews uh, a few weeks ago, Hebrews 9, verse 5, the last part of verse 5. Um, it's kind of become my, my verse for any teaching that I do because I very rarely get through everything I plan to say. But the, this verse, it's the last part of verse 5 in chapter 9 of Hebrews. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail. Okay. So of these things we cannot speak now in detail, but you've got the rest of your life of Bible study. Yeah, and, and as I mentioned, what the DBS does, it doesn't answer all your questions, but it will give you the tools to ask better questions. Um, that you will be able to, you have the tools to continue to study for the rest of your life. And you invest 20, 30, 40 years of Bible study, that you'll be, you'll be able to answer some of your own questions. And you'll be able to talk about some of these things in more detail than we can today. Okay, but let me, let me pray for you. Father, I'm so grateful. This is such a privileged class, and I'm, such, I'm so privileged to be here with them for this short time. Father, I look around this room, and I see the people that you are calling to do great exploits for you. I see you calling them to plant churches, to go to difficult areas, to reach cities, to reach families, to preach your word to reach the people that are in the church, the, the people that are the dry bones now. Father, I, I look around and I see great, great exploits of faith in the Muslim world, in the Chinese world, and all the other nations that they're called to. Father, I pray that you would continue to encourage them um, in the rest of their life of Bible study, that you would encourage them that that you would give them grace for the, for the cost that they will pay, that you would give them grace for the <coughs> feeling of no success, Lord, that you will give them grace and mercy for that, that you will give them encouragement every day, that you will reach them where they need to be reached, that they won't give up, that they won't turn away from the things that you've asked them to do because it pays off in the end. There's a great reward, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. Um, you've called us and you will give us grace to endure. I am confident of that um, for these wonderful, amazing people that you brought here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.